So hey guys, Mike here. So today we're gonna answer all your questions and comments. I really appreciate all of them. It was definitely a wide variety of questions from what kind of investor am I? Where do you put your money in a down market or if we get a pullback? And then also uh, some of you guys brought up some good suggestions on, we talked about triple leverage ETFs as well. One of you guys brought up a good one, so I'll bring that one into it. And some other ones, so as usual, let's get right into it and feel free to participate in the comments or ask any more questions uh, if you like. And the first comment is about what we talked about last week with triple leverage ETFs when you guys are asking about them. And he says, also USD is the better semiconductor play versus Soxel. And I want to bring this up. Uh, it's up nearly 700% as they hold more NVIDIA. And so when we look at this, what he's talking about here, here is ProShares Ultra Semiconductors USD going for 99.26 as of last week. And when you look, yep, NVIDIA is 28%. And then you see the rest of them fall off, Broadcom at 8, AMD, Intel. But when you really look over here at Soxel, you might be surprised what's actually held in this one. You can see it's about half the price, but when you look at what it holds, you can see NVIDIA only counts about 8%. You got other things that might surprise you, like uh, Dreyfus Treasury Securities Cash Management. And you can see AMD and Broadcom almost account for as much as NVIDIA. And when you look over at the chart, you can see USD has performed better because, by quite a bit, because of that sh weighted share in NVIDIA because it's had such a good run up uh, when you look at it. So, yeah. Uh, definitely a good one to look into if you're looking into it. Now, if you're looking as far as like liquidity, yes, this one doesn't have you anywhere near the volume as a Soxel would have or anything like that. You can see it's millions and millions of shares uh, every day are going to be traded on Soxel. And then when you go to USD, uh, very, very, very little volume compared to Soxel, of course. But again, a run-up's a run-up. So uh, there you go. And again, it's also going to have bigger drawdowns if NVIDIA, of course, uh, has a big drawdown of stuff or semis in general. So, you know, just kind of keep that in mind. So I appreciate you bringing that one to our attention. And the next one is an interesting one here. And I want you to read this question very carefully. Hey, Mike, I noticed you cover the Russell 2000 frequently. Any thoughts on the Russell 200 growth ETF IWY? Remember Russell 2000 IWM? The small caps, or the micro caps, excuse me, are IWC. And when you look at this and pull it up, you go, whew, man, IWY handily outperforming IWM. I mean, doubling it basically, right? No matter what time frame you go to, it's just crushing it on the returns. You're like, whoo, man, wish I'd have known about this one. Would have been buying IWM or anything. How about that? And then when you come over here, you're like, you know, again, volume. Big thing, right? It's gonna be much less on IWY than it would be on an IWM, of course. You know, I don't think I should shock anybody. And then when you get over here and you go, I gotta look to see what kind of growth stocks they got off the Russell, you know, 2000 here. And when you look, wait a minute, I don't think Microsoft and Apple and Nvidia and Amazon are on there, are they? But I double check, that's that's what IWY is, right? When you, you scroll back and look yourself right here, got the ticker. And you realize, oh boy, just because, and, and, and I was mistaken when I first saw it too. I thought, oh, I've never heard of this one before. And it has Russell in it. It has 200, not 2000, right? And it's IW something, right? It's IWY versus IWM versus IWC, right? And so when you look at it, I mean, I can see why somebody would, I'm assuming that was the mistake. So if you wrote the question, please let me know. Do you think IWY was a kind of a competitor for IWM and growth stocks were coming maybe off the IWM and there was small cap growth stocks person. That one's more like a Fangu, a FNGU or something who holds these uh, mega caps and stuff. And so a uh, good performer though, you know, so it's another one to put on your list and stuff, but no, nah, I mean, I don't, I don't really know what that would have to do with IWM. So please let me know uh, if you meant something else in the comments and uh, I can definitely see why you would think IWY with the Russell in the name and all this stuff, it just missing one zero, of course, instead of 2,200. Off the face of it, I can see where, if you did make a mistake, why you made it, okay? And before we continue, guys, you can please hit that thumbs up. It helps people find the video. And think about subscribing if you like this kind of content. Now, next one says, on a descending market, where does a guy put his money? Does he hold his long stocks or sell or transfer somewhere safe while still making a few percent? I'm assuming, you know, because we're in an ascending market now, we're talking about a bear market. Now, some short-term 5%, 10% pullback, right? And so one of the things you got to realize is you're probably not even going to know we're in a bear market, but if you're looking for something to kind of tell you, remember nothing good happens below the 200. Anytime you see it, this is 2022. It's going to fall behind, pull up the 200 daily moving average, go to a weekly chart. It's going to come up and do a retest, right? And usually it's going to fail if we're going in a bear market, okay? I don't care where you're at. I think it's done it every single time. Even in 2020, you did have a comeback up and fail 
right there before it fell. But again, the only way it's going to fall straight down is if there's some kind of black swan event. But you can see it right here in 2018, same way. Uh, and I had several, uh, multiple uh, retests of the 200. Here's 2008 again, and it's going to become resistance instead of support, right? Uh, 2001, you can see the exact same thing right there. And so that's that's really kind of the first thing you got to be looking at and deciding. But it's not just that I'm looking at. You got to start pulling up all kinds of stuff. Like where's unemployment going? Uh, where's like XLU, the defensive stocks, XLB, things like that going versus the SPY? Because if they're coming up, that means big money is rolling into these and they're expecting something to be happening. And usually they'll come within like weeks of each other from the two, we're us dropping below the 200. And then second of all, it's up to you where you want to put your money because it depends on how old you are, right? I mean, you're in your 20s, you're in your 60s. That's a big difference, right? You got two different goals going on there and, and, and many more years left to say when you're in your 20s, assuming you live a regular life and things like that. And plus, what are your goals? What's your risk profile, right? I mean, for me personally, it's like, you know, if, for example, if you're holding a boatload of Kathy Wood stocks and we're going to a bear market and everything kind of confirms that, whew, you, you better buckle up for the big drawdown if you're going to hold, Right. Versus if you're in some mega cap like a Microsoft and Apple, whatever, these kind of stocks, a blue chip stock, sure there's going to be a drawdown, but you know, you know the, the hedge funds are going to roll right back into them when it's all over and you're going to recap your gains, right? I mean, that's going to happen uh, pretty quickly, actually, once you pull out of it and you can DC, not, not buy the dip, DC, okay? into them at certain levels, whatever those levels may be. Usually a lot of people what they'll do for mega caps or blue chip stocks in general, you know, to be a mega cap to be a blue chip stock is, you know, if they go down 20%, 50%, that kind of stuff, right? And they'll have their capital set aside. And if it goes down 20%, they'll put 20% of that capital in. And if it keeps dropping down to 30%, they'll put 30% more in, that kind of stuff. Some people use FIBs. Whenever it goes down to 50 Fibonacci retracement on that move up, boom, uh, they'll go in that way. So you kind of got to have your own thing you want to do there. And, and, and the one big rule is don't let anybody tell you, you know, cash is a king. Cash is king in a bear market. Cash you can call trash in a, a bull market because everything's going up, right? But in a bear market, if a stock's $100 and you only have $100 before the bear market hits, you can buy one share, right? But if it drops, you know, to $50, now you can buy two shares, right? And so, uh, and again, a lot of people found that out in the last bear market when they just kept buying every single dip. And I, I can't even I count how many people said, I ain't got no more money. And it fell a lot more after that, right? And so, you know, it's just, you got, you got to be patient. But, you know, again, nothing's going to uh, be dollar cost average for a lot of folks. That's just the way it is. And so it's up to you where you want to put your capital. But, and nowadays with the rates being where they're at, it's been a long time. Even if your capital is sitting in like a swap, fidelity, just sitting in an account, waiting to be purchased stocks, whatever you're going to purchase, they're paying you five or 6%, right? So, I mean, that's what's going on now. Maybe it won't happen. If the market goes down, maybe they'll drop rates to zero. But, you know, so that, that's my opinion on that one. Let me know what you guys think and, and how you handle that stuff. Now, next one says, what do you think about cover call ETFs? I wonder not only about how consistent they can be in different markets, but also about how sustainable they are when more and more of them are getting created. And, you know, if, for those who don't know, a cover call ETF, it's another way you form you get paid dividends, right? But what they do is they own, so ETF, they own the shares and they're selling a call option, right? Saying, okay, I'm going to sell an 80 call option. The stock price is at 70. And if it gets to 80 or above, they're going to lose the shares, right? But if it doesn't, they get to keep what they call the premium. Okay. And so that's really the big thing you got to look at in that right there. So again, there, you see the popular ones at the bottom right there. And you're not going to get rich off these things. I'll tell you that right now. It's really another source of income. It's kind of like people who love dividend stocks. But this the stock part of itself is not going to move a lot at all. Okay. I and mean, when you look at these right here compared to the S&P 500, you can see not very good, right? And so, you know, that's not where you're going to get it. This, this is people looking for just an extra side income. So they'll get that dividend because most of these pay monthly, not quarterly. You know, some of them do pay quarterly, as you'll get to see. And we look over here. You can see I'm talking about this is Jeppy. It's one of the more popular ones. It pays every month, 6.2% dividend yield. You can see it right there. It does change as it goes on and stuff. And then you can see the S&P. It pays quarterly. You see what it pays. You can see the dividend yield. And so it really depends on, you know, I think where you're at, what kind of risk profile you have. If you like that extra income, if you're really a big dividend person, uh, then, then it's probably a good thing for you. It's not my thing. I'd rather just sell the cover calls myself on the stock I own and sell cash credit puts. But you know, you do you and uh, let me know what you think. If you guys are in those things, let me know which one you like the best. All right. The next one comes from Jeff and he says, you say the market isn't the economy, yet you take time to address upcoming economic statistics. I sure do. So maybe the stock market isn't the economy and you know what? 
It never has been. It never was. But there are obviously economic events that influence liquidity and market dynamics. So it's not like we're talking baseball cards maybe addressing where the market and economy intersect or why the market chooses to ignore the economy at a certain time would be a better use of time. And I appreciate that comment, Jeff. And maybe you are new to the channel or hadn't been watching for a while or something, but I do address that a lot. Maybe you let me know in the comments if I don't address it enough, especially, I mean, I know I do it in members videos, I do it in public videos. So yes, uh, there's a couple of reasons I do it. One, red folder news, which was your inflation data, things of that nature, jobs data, that will affect the market. Uh, and then of course, also I like to be educated. Like I like to build a whole conversation with somebody and correct somebody who just watches one mainstream media channel. And of course that channel, we all know there's one channel that's biased for one party. There's another channel that's biased for another party and they skew it and you never get the full truth anyway. And then most people get their news from social media anyway, which is kind of a mess. So yeah, I like to be able to say, mm, nope, that's not true. You know, and they go, what, what? It's like, how do you know that? It's like, because I put it out there. I research it. I, there's these things called government websites and all this data you can pull and actually get the real facts. So yes, uh, I do do that stuff. If I don't do it enough, folks, let me know. Put it in the comments stuff. I'll do even more of it for you. Not a problem. And so, you know, I'll continue to do that. I mean, I literally do a video, uh, try to do it once a month on recession watch and all these different things that actually can affect the market and all that good stuff. So you know, yes, I like to stay in tune to it. So, uh, yeah, I appreciate that comment. I'll continue to do that. And maybe I'll try to do it more if people let me know. Now, next comment says, do companies get tax deductions for the money they spent on their lobbying efforts? And for those who are unaware, last week we talked about this in the video, you know, about Apple getting investigated on. I said, you know, all you have to do is pull out the checkbook, start writing checks because they've been slacking, right? Out of all the big companies, you know, they've increased their efforts quite a bit, but they're still slacking, man. They're not writing as much as Meta and Google and Apple and stuff. And so, of course, that's the donations. And so when I looked it up on the IRS website, shockingly, they don't get to write it off. It is not a write-off, which I'm happy to see. I mean, I guess that's progress or whatever. I'm sure they'll bribe somebody up there in Congress to write a bill to let them write this stuff off. So, you know, that is a good thing, uh, to say the least. And so... Appreciate that question because I didn't know the answer either. And I'm curious if you live in another country and watch this channel, like, is that how it is in your country? Do your large corporations write your politicians big checks to kill bills, write bills, you know, uh, all that good stuff and try to uh, help them out and stuff? I'm just curious if it's just an American thing or it's all over the world. Um, and one uh, question I did not put in here from Dr. Marcus, who's always uh, got some good questions. He was saying, you know, what kind of investor am I? And I'll say one, probably more of a long-term investor learning more and trying to get better at trading and things like that because i think that's a big thing trying to get better options because that's we've seen how the effect that has on the market and stuff uh, but i'll say the, the biggest thing i am is i'm an adapting trader i'm, I'm learning that marine crow a long time ago adapt and overcome and i'm one of those people i'm very flexible and so if i have an opinion on something and data comes my way this factual data that differs from my opinion i'm willing to shift my opinion that's how i am it's no different when investing if i find a better way to invest i'm going to do that Right. I will say one big thing I, I, I harp on is, you know, I'm big on Roth IRAs. You know, my spouse and I both have one. So max it out every year. That's a big one. Uh, you know, and so, yeah, but yeah, I'm more of a long term investor, but I also swing trade. I've gotten into trading over the last couple of years. So that's a big thing I like to do. And I like to get better at it. Right. And so uh, as information comes along, I'll continue to adapt my processes and everything. And so I like to do back tests and read about back tests and what works best and all that good stuff. So that's just me. I'm kind of a nerd when it comes to that stuff. So let me know in the comments, um, you know, what you found the most successful and share with people if you feel comfortable, uh, the most successful when it comes to trading or investing, either one and what you recommend. So anyway, hope you guys got something out of it. Please hit that like and subscribe button on your way out. Please feel free to ask any more questions. I'll put them in next Saturday's video for you. All right. Have a good one, guys. Enjoy your Easter Sunday if you celebrate that. All right. Have a good one.